Hello and welcome into another episode of Lockdown Wolves. Today on the show, one of my favorite topics, Jalen Noel, and just how vital his performance will be to the Timberwolves in the upcoming season. We'll talk about the offseason that led to what's certainly going to be an increased and more consistent role for Jalen, and also just how good he was offensively last year. I don't think we've talked about this enough. He was fantastic offensively for the Wolves. What he'll need to do this year to fill that role for Minnesota. We'll talk about it all today on the show. Welcome in. You are Locked on Wolves. You are Locked on Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked on Wolves podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Happy Hump Day. And a big thank you for making Locked On Wolves your first listen each and every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, wherever you listen to podcasts, as well as on YouTube. You can also follow on Twitter at Locked On T Wolves and my account at B Beacon. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see that below on the screen. Uh, today on the show, I want to talk all things Jalen Noel. He is, I you know, Going back a couple of years, I talked him up heading into last year. I actually talked him up the middle of the previous year when he finally got a little bit of run towards the end of the Ryan Saunders coaching tenure. Um, and I I thought, you know, hey, the Wolves need offense. They need three-point shooting. This guy's done it in college. He's done it in the G League. Even though he struggled as a rookie in very limited playing time at the NBA level, I thought Jalen Noel has the three-level scoring ability that the Wolves need to take a look at. We saw it a little bit year before last towards the end of Saunders and the beginning of Chris Finch's tenure uh, coaching the Wolves. And then last season, he was on again, off again in the rotation. And ultimately, it was a vital part of the rotation, a big part of the down the stretch in the playoff rotation. Um, and this season, given the Wolves playoff or the Wolves, excuse me, Wolves roster moves this offseason, um, we know he's going to be a huge part of the 2022-23 Timberwolves team. And if they're going to have any success, you got to replicate and, and perhaps even improve on what he did last year. So I want to talk about how we got to this point now. And then I want to spend the rest of the show talking about just how good Jalen Noel's season was last year. And we've touched on it. You know, we, we've talked about it off and on, um, but I think it needs a whole show because he was absolutely fantastic. I said, it, uh, this is the last time I'll bring up uh, how right I've been about Jalen Noel. I promise. Leading into last season, um, I was on the Lockdown NBA show and the Lockdown Fantasy Basketball show. I think it was maybe the fantasy show with Josh Lloyd, who does an awesome job over there. And he was asking me for an under-the-radar Timberwolves player uh, who who would break into the rotation. And I said Jalen Noel. And I think he thought, I, like he had a list of the top 10 rotation guys. Noel was not on that list. I And I said, look, I think Noel's going to get some run and I think he's going to be really good. Now, from a fantasy perspective, the volume maybe wasn't there, certainly for the whole season last year. But from an actual on-court impact perspective, even recently, uh, I believe it was, and I guess maybe I shouldn't throw him under the bus. Wolves and him. I think it was John Hollinger at the athletic, but there were a couple of national writers who talked about the wolves depth and some concerns, et cetera, and never even brought up Jalen Noel. Um, I don't think it was Hollinger. Hollinger usually does a good job with, I think he usually mentions Noel. It might've been, well, I, I don't know. So there were at least a couple of national writers who, who didn't, who failed to mention Jalen Noel would talk about the wolves roster and, you know, this upcoming season, Jalen's very likely like the sixth man on this team now. Um, it doesn't, it, it's absurd to ignore the impact that he's going to have on this season for the wolves. And, and here's why. So, well, well, number one, I, I should mention that the Timberwolves turnover this off season, you know, it, we always talk about this go bear trading kind of shorthand, like, oh, they traded three rotation guys. They traded, um, you know, a couple of starters, which are, which is true, right? Patrick Beverly, and Jared Vanderbilt were ultimately starters for the wolves last year when, you know, at, through, from the midway point of the season through the rest of the year. And Malik Beasley, you know, those three real rotation guys. Yes, Bomaro and Kessler, the you know, the picks. But the three rotation guy trade for Gobert is a shorthand way of talking about it and, and to represent like, hey, they gave up a lot in addition to all those draft draft picks and that overall draft capital that they gave up. That's true, but they traded three rotation guys and got back an all NBA player in Rudy Gobert. So now you're only needing to fill two rotation spots. And how are the Wolves gonna do that? Well, so basically, Gobert and, and Kyle Anderson, who they signed in free agency, are going to fill the Vanderbilt minutes and probably pull some minutes away from Nas Reed. That means that the Beasley and Beverly minutes are going to have to be filled by Bryn Forbes and Austin Rivers, both good veteran players, 
Um, both players that Tim Connolly brought in after having them in Denver last season. And they're both going to have a strong impact on the team this year. However, neither one of them is as good as Jalen Noel. The biggest and, and, and most likely way that they're going to fill uh, vacated minutes for both Patrick Beverly and, and Malik Beasley really is Jalen Noel in terms of a growth in role, a growth in his performance. We'll talk a little bit about his defense. He's got to improve defensively. Obviously he's not going to fill in for what Patrick Beverly did on the defensive end of the floor, but Bryn Forbes isn't a good defender. Austin Nervous is a pretty average defender. Forbes is a good catch and shoot three point guy. He's not doing much else for you offensively. Austin Rivers is more, more well-rounded, but not really great at anything. Those guys are good depth pieces. The Timberwolves are not going to fill the starting role of Patrick Beverly. Obviously, Jay, uh, uh, Jade McDaniels, excuse me, will slide into the starting lineup and, you know, they'll kind of backfill the minutes that way. I don't think Jordan McLaughlin will start. Clearly, McLaughlin's role increases with the exit of Patrick Beverly. But I think the bigger thing is here, those minutes overall, they'll that increase will partly be taken on by Jordan McLaughlin, but it's going to have to be Jalen Noel that's replacing the production of Malik Beasley. Um, the production, albeit, you know, the actual numbers were much lower for Patrick Beverly, but the threat to spread the floor, uh, the defensive tenacity is going to have to be a mix of guys to 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 backfill that. But Jalen Noel has to replace the scoring capabilities of Malik Beasley and beyond that. And he will because he's a different player and he could do more offensively. We'll get into that here in a minute uh, because I think it's important to point out, like, I think on its face, you know, maybe casual fans or people who aren't Timberwolves fans or maybe, you know, don't watch every game might just assume, okay, Jalen Noel, high volume, high usage bench guy, like similar to Malik Beasley can shoot threes. No, they're very different players stylistically and, and also like literally, if you look at their results, um, they don't they don't approach the game the same way, and the results aren't exactly the same either. Um, so I want to talk about Jalen Noel's season last year for the Wolves, just how efficient and how good he was offensively. Some lineup data to kind of back that up. Look at some advanced metrics and talk about where on the floor he was best, and, and give a couple of examples of of just how good he was. Um, so we're gonna do that here next. First, though, let's talk about our friends over at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Um, of course, NFL preseason. I think the first preseason game is in like a week at this point. Most teams are in training camp now. They all kicked off over the past few days. You could bet on NFL futures. You could bet on preseason games here very shortly. Who knows? The lines are probably already there. And also NBA futures. I mentioned this the other day. I, I haven't checked the win total in a couple of days, but the Wolves projected win total on bet online was a little low. So hit that over. Um, if, if you're going to do it, now's the time. Bet online continues to be the top online resource for all your sport wagering information from live in-game betting scores and podcasts. They have you covered. Head to bet online today or use your mobile device to learn more. But all the action happening today, bet online where the game starts. All right, let's talk about Jalen Noel's season last year. Um, so if you just want to look straight advanced metrics and, you know, the win shares is, is famously uh new owner. Mark Laurie is a big fan of win shares. I think it's a great kind of like quick and dirty, all encompassing stat. Like, Hey, was somebody good this year? Win shares per 48. Like that gives you a, a snapshot, right? It's not the end all be all. Like for instance, I believe uh, Jade McDaniels, yeah, he was like 14. Jade McDaniels was 14th on the Wolves and win shares. It's not going to accurately depict defensive, uh, effort, um, defensive versatility. There's it's no one stat is going to do all this. Right. But in shares, you know, Jalen Noel was, was uh fifth on the team in win shares per 48. And he finished behind Nate Knight and Greg Monroe because those guys didn't play that many minutes. So you take them out and he was third behind towns and Jared Vanderbilt and just ahead of Patrick Beverly. So obviously that's a really telling statistic, um, in terms of straight win shares, you know, he's still in the top eight because again, played a relatively small number of minutes compared to guys you know, that's volume based, right? So obviously Anthony Edwards, uh, guys who Malik Beasley, guys who played heavy minutes, Angel Russell are going to be ahead of him there. Um, however, it, those stats also rely heavily on efficiency. So, um, offensive efficiency and rebounding factor into win shares really heavily. 
in terms of efficiency, I thought this was really fascinating. If you look at the Timberwolves as a team last season, their true shooting percentages individually and their effective field goal percentage. So uh, a refresher, if you're not familiar, true shooting is is a is a measure of field goal percentage or I guess shooting efficiency that factors in not just field goals overall. So field goal percentage is obviously your percentage of total made field goals, three point two point percentage. Obviously, they are what they are. Um, true shooting takes into account it weights two pointers, three pointers, and free throws. So it, the, there's an impact of like, hey, you're scoring from everywhere on the floor. What's your two point percentage, three point percentage, and frequency and effectiveness of free throw shooting? Effective field goal percentage is just three pointers and two pointers. So similar stats, true shooting, the differences takes into account free throws. So I'm going to cite both of them. Jalen Noel had the best true shooting percentage of any perimeter Timberwolves player, or what I'll say, I'll say is any non big on the Timberwolves, except for Torian Prince who barely edged him out by 0.8%. Um, another way to say this would be he had the best true shooting percentage of any guard on the Wolves, better than Anthony Edwards, better than D'Angelo Russell, better than far better than Malik Beasley, better than Patrick Beverly, better than Jordan McLaughlin. He had the best true shooting percentage, 58.1% of any perimeter or any guard, any backcourt player for the Wolves. Bigs, of course, are going to have a higher mark there because they shoot the field goal percentage is going to be higher in general because they shoot close to the basket. Of course, Carl Anthony Towns has an otherworldly true shooting of 64% because he's great in close and he's great from beyond the arc and he's a good free throw shooter. So all those things together, clearly he had the Wolves best true shooting percentage. You know, Vando, Nasri, those guys have higher true shooting percentages because of where they were taking the majority of their shots. Effective field goal percentage, a very similar story there. If you sort the team by effective field goal percentage from last season, Jalen Wells effectively fifth overall. We'll take out McKinley, right? Well, actually we'll call him fourth overall. Cause we'll also take out Greg Monroe. So he's only behind towns, Vanderbilt Prince. Again, the best guard, the best backcourt player on the wolves in terms of effective field goal percentage, 55.1% for comparison's sake, Malik Beasley was 53%. Anthony Edwards was 52.7. D'Lo was just a hair over 50%. Same with Patrick Beverly. Um, just around 50% effective field goal percentage. And Jalen Noel was 55.1% in terms of effective field goal percentage. So the shooting efficiency was the best of any backcourt player on the Timberwolves and saved for Torrey and Prince, the best of any player that spent a good bulk of their minutes on the perimeter this season. Another way to look at this is Jalen Noel was actually better in every single zone on the floor, except for the long mid range, the 16 to 16 foot to three point line. Uh, percentage better in every area except for that than Anthony Edwards. He was far better at the rim than Anthony Edwards. Well, far better is maybe a little bit of an exaggeration. Um, Anthony Edwards last season shot 65.8% at the rim, which is fine. Jalen Noel, and I talked about this actually on whatever day that uh, Wednesday show, or I guess it was late last week. And then I also talked about it. Uh, with Jackson Gatlin, I didn't mention this the other day, but I was on I was on uh, Lockdown Rockets on Monday to talk about the comparison between Jalen Green year two upcoming and what Ant did from year one to year two. One of the things I talked about is Ant's got to improve at the rim. He's good at the rim, but with his size and athleticism and scoring acumen and, and touch and all that stuff, he should be better than 65.8%. Well, Jalen Well was 67.9% at the rim. So Jordan McLaughlin, or excuse me, yeah, McLaughlin and D'Angelo Russell both had higher marks, but that's because those guys are mostly shooting open layups at the rim. Well, that's not necessarily true with McLaughlin. He made tough shots at the rim. D'Lo's most, mostly shooting, if he's at the rim, he's shooting a, a, a mostly open layup or trying to draw a foul and often does, which is why that number is so high. But Jalen Noel at 67.9% is better than Ant at 65.8%. And then you look at every single range on the floor, three to 10 feet, Jalen Noel 43% from three to 10 feet, significantly better than Anthony Edwards, 35.6%. And the point here isn't to put down Edwards because obviously Edwards had a fantastic season and he's dynamic and the whole thing. The point is to say just how good Jalen Noel was that we're completely overlooking how much better he was than, than Anthony Edwards in nearly every spot on the floor. He was 50.8% from 10 to 16 feet, which is true, you know, mid range elbows. Uh, Anthony Edwards was only 33.8% from that range. Now it's a relatively small number of his shots that he's shooting from there, like literally less than 6%, but still Jalen Noel over 50% from that range, Anthony Edwards under 34%, 16 feet to the three point line. Both were actually pretty good. It was just a hair under 36%. Jalen was only 0.06 behind him. So virtually the same number there. 
And then from beyond the arc, Jalen Noel had the second best mark on the Wolves next to Carl Anthony Towns in three point shooting 39.4% from deep. It was just, you know, basically a league average, 35.7% league average is right around 35 and a half percent this year. So Jalen Noel was nearly four points better on threes than Ant. So the only area they're they're really close is the 16 foot to three point line range. Otherwise, zero to three feet, three to 10 feet, 10 to 16 beyond the arc. Jalen Noel was a better shooter than Anthony Edwards in all each of those spots on the floor. He is a legit three level score. Jalen Noel can score from anywhere on the floor. We've talked about this before. And the best way I can characterize it is I think he's more of a mix. And I've said this before in the show. He's not at all like Malik Beasley. Malik Beasley was a was a through and through pure catch and shoot guy, transition score both at the rim and in catch and shoot, a movement shooter in the on the offense. You play ran a handful of sets for him each game to get him a catch and shoot three. His release was lightning fast. That's what he did really well, and, and he was pretty elite at it. A very very good catch and shoot three point shooter. Malik Beasley is. Jalen Noel is far more similar to D'Angelo Russell and Anthony Edwards in his ability to score at all levels and his the way he goes about it than he is to Malik Beasley. And he's not athletic enough, or excuse me, that's not the right way to say that. He's not as athletic as Anthony Edwards, obviously. He is more athletic than D'Angelo Russell. He's almost kind of a cross between the two of them. I think at this stage, he's every bit as good of a passer as Anthony Edwards. He's not quite the passer of D'Angelo Russell. He is uh, better at the rim than D'Angelo Russell, even though D'Angelo had the better percentage. Noel's more comfortable, I think, at the rim. Um, he doesn't obviously have the explosion of Anthony Edwards. He's better in the mid-range than Ant. He's probably not quite to the level as D'Lo in terms of getting a shot off and being successful in the mid-range, but they're really similar. Um, and in terms of three-point shooting, he's obviously better than both of them as of right now. Before last year, the percentages weren't quite there at the professional level, but he did it in college, Pac-12 Player of the Year a few years ago. He did it in the G League um, in his first year there. So we all we knew, and this is one of the reasons I pumped him up last year. We knew he could shoot the three. It was a matter of getting the opportunity, getting into a rhythm throughout the course of the season. But his actual game functionally is a cross between Ant and D'Lo, far more than it is Malik Beasley's game, which is fascinating because that means you can play him with one of those guys, or you could play him as your primary scorer and ball handler off the bench. Now Jordan McLaughlin's the backup point guard, but. Is Jalen Noel going to see some of those initiate, you know, in, in, those minutes initiating the offense? He had to out of necessity last year a few times because of COVID, lack of depth. They didn't trust McKinley Wright to be the emergency point guard, obviously. Um, and now there is no, uh, right. I mean, there could still sign a two way guy, but right now it's D'Lo and it's Jordan McLaughlin. And then it's Bryn Forbes, Austin Rivers, Jalen Noel. Of those options, Jalen Noel is your best option to run backup point if one of those guys is in foul trouble or depending on matchups, if you need a bigger body out there. If you need scoring, Noel's obviously going to provide a lot more of that for you than Jordan McLaughlin. So I think the fact that he, in my mind, is a very strong hybrid between D'Angelo Russell and Anthony Edwards, two very dynamic offensive players, that's a really attractive player. So he's going to get opportunities this year, whether it's off the ball or on the ball, off the bench. Nationally, people don't know who he is. They're going to know very quickly because this team is going to be a national TV more. People are going to be talking about the Wolves. And Jalen Noel is going to be the guy off the bench for this Timberwolves team and play multiple roles. He'll play the one. He'll play the two. He probably won't play the three very often this year, but he'll be on the floor quite a bit. I want to talk about lineup data next. I want to talk a little bit about where he's got to improve. Uh, but some interesting things about about the uh, the Wolves, some three-man lineups basically involving Jalen Noel. So that's how I want to close the show here today. All right, uh, Jalen Noel is going to have a massive role off the bench for this year, but something that might surprise you, and maybe not after I spent the entire last segment we talking about how efficient he was offensively. Looking at the lineup data, Jalen Noel was an absolutely vital part of what the Timberwolves did last year. Um, even though the numbers were good and relatively low volume, look at the, this is crazy. I went to NBA.com, I looked at the top three-man lineups for the Wolves last year, and I eliminated anything any lineup that played less than 80 minutes together. Admittedly, that's somewhat arbitrary. But actually, now that I'm saying that, I could have gone to 100 and this would still stand. So I, I did 80 minutes or more because I thought that was like, that's a decent sample size. There were only a couple like weird outliers in here at this number. So like 
there. Well, we don't need to talk about the outliers. Anyway, I went to lineups that played 80 or more minutes together last year. I looked at three man lineups and guess who was in the top four lineups, three man lineups for the wolves last year by net rating. Jalen Newell was in all three of the top or excuse me, all four of the top three man lineups and six of the top eight, three man lineups for the wolves last year. Jalen Noel, not Carl Anthony Towns, not Anthony Edwards, not D'Angelo Russell, not Jaden McDaniels, Jalen Noel. The number one three-man lineup that actually played 164 minutes together, which is a decent sample size. It's more than most of the other uh, lineups that are here in the top, you know, the, the positive lineups. Uh, played 164 minutes together was Malik Beasley, Torian Prince, and Jalen Noel. This is fascinating to me because those are three guys who often were asked to play maybe a position, a position off from where they are. So I don't know how many of these minutes were Jalen Noel at or where they should normally play. I don't know how many of these minutes Noel was maybe playing the one and Beasley was at the two and Prince was at the three and maybe it was a, a big lineup or if it was a small lineup with Noel at the two, Beasley at the three and Prince at the four. Uh, but it was an effective lineup. But 164 minutes, they had a 28.1 net rating. Uh, now, obviously, Beasley's not on the team anymore. But uh, I don't know, plug in Bryn Forbes there and he can replicate at least the catch and shoot portion. He's not as dynamic, not as good of an all around player, but uh, I think you can kind of replicate that pretty well. The second lineup on this list, Jalen Noel, Jordan McLaughlin and Carl Anthony Towns. Those guys are obviously still all on the team. 26.7, a plus 26.7 net rating in over 100 minutes. The next lineup, Jalen Noel, Jordan McLaughlin again and Malik Beasley. Of course, Beasley no longer on the team. The, the lineup after that, this is interesting. Jalen Noel, Torian Prince, and Carl Anthony Towns. So I would imagine there's some overlap here between this lineup and the first one. Obviously, there is with Prince and Noel. But are we looking at a lineup that was big with Noel, Prince, Beasley, Towns at the five, and you know probably Vanderbilt or McDaniels at the four? Um, so that's a conversation for another day because another thing we're going to do this offseason is dig into those five-man lineups from last year and look for some patterns. Um, but when we're strictly talking about Noel, the top four three-man lineups involve Jalen Noel. And then also lineup number six, Noel, Beasley, Towns. Lineup number eight, Noel, Beverly, Towns. So yeah, of those, what is that, six lineups, four of them include at least one player or I guess exactly one player who's no longer with the team. But that's going to be the case when you lose three of your top seven rotation guys. But the the moral of the story here is the top four three-man lineups and six of the top eight all include Jalen Noel. There's no other common thread there. I mean, Carl Anthony Towns was in four of those six lineups. Uh, Anthony Edwards was actually in none of those six lineups, notably. D'Angelo Russell in none of those six lineups. There's a lot of Jordan McLaughlin, a lot of Carl Anthony Towns, and a lot of uh, a lot of Jalen Noel in those, in those top three man lineups. And uh, that probably should not be surprising based on what we know about what the advanced stats say about e the seasons that each of those guys have. I mean, you could argue that Jalen was the best backcourt offensive player for the wolves this year. Now, D'Angelo Russell was also very good. I think it's easy to overlook because of the issues at the end of the season. And I've talked about this before. D'Lo had a good season last year. And let's not forget that Jalen was probably a little better overall offensively defensively, I would argue D'Angelo Russell played a, a more important and a, a better role than Jalen Noel did, certainly more consistent, which is not something I think we've ever, anybody's ever been able to say about D'Lo defensively. Um, I'll throw another advanced stat out there, the ESPN real plus minus, which I've said this before, is my favorite stat for in terms of like an all-encompassing stat um, that tries to account for defense. You know, it's, it's rate-based and that it takes numbers per 100 possessions. Um, and so if you want to take that, I, I think that, I, I think it's a, a good stat. D'Angelo Russell, um, just for just, I thought this was intriguing. I didn't realize he was this high in ESPN real plus minus. He actually finished seventh among all point guards league wide in total real plus minus. So both offense and defense together behind only Steph Curry, Trey Young, Chris Paul, Luka Doncic, Mike Conley, which was almost entirely defensive, defensively based and, and surprised me. And Darius Garland, you're talking about several all-stars and guys who have been all-stars. And D'Lo seventh, ahead of DeJounte, well, actually tied with DeJounte Murray, ahead of Monty Morris in Denver, ahead of LaMelo Ball, ahead of Kyle Lowry, Reggie Jackson, Shea Gildas Alexander, Tyrese Maxey, John Morant. D'Lo finished ahead of all those guys, all those guys, excuse me, in terms of overall real plus minus at ESPN, which is really fascinating. Now, you look at shooting guards and offensive real plus minus, and Jalen Wells on the list. He's 14th in offensive real plus minus. 
you know, behind it, some pretty big names. I mean, Donovan Mitchell was first, for instance, in that category. And I should say, actually, Jalen's really 13th. We'll take out Sam Merrill because he played six games for the Grizzlies. Um, James Harden was second in offensive real plus minus. Kelly Bray Jr., Devin Booker, Clay Thompson, on and on, Zach Levine, Paul George, guys who, in limited minutes, who are well-known as great offensive players. And Jalen was 14th with a 2.11 offensive real plus minus. However, the defense was so bad. It was a negative 4.23. Delos was a positive plus two something or other. Um, Jalen's was a minus 4.23, which kicks him. His overall real plus minus was a negative uh, 2.12, which brings him all the way down to 56th on the list in terms of shooting guards, their overall real plus minus. Uh, D'Angelo Russell, again, was seventh among point guards. So uh, not great. And it's entirely defense. That's the issue there. Again, not the end all be all. I get that. Um, but I think it's interesting and important to point out. Um, notably, though, if you look at just defensive real plus minus, Jalen Well was 115th with his negative 4.23. You know who is one spot ahead of him? 114th. New Timberwolf, Bryn Forbes, finished 114th with a negative 4.21 defensive real plus minus. So take that for what it's worth. The Wolves are going to have a couple of perimeter issues um, coming off the bench. Austin Rivers is better than that, but not a great defender. It's all about what can D'Lo bring, what can Jordan McLaughlin bring, the the length and the range of Anthony Edwards, Jade McDaniels. That's going to be kind of what the Wolves rely on defensively. That's a conversation for another day. What I want to leave you with is that Jalen Noel was really good last year. Yes, the defense is a problem, but Malik Beasley didn't play much defense either. He was maybe marginally better than, than Noel last year on that end of the floor. But Jalen Noel will be vital to the Timberwolves offensively this year. He's going to play the one. He's going to play the two. He's going to be the one to backfill the Malik Beasley, Patrick Beverly vacated minutes in the backcourt. And if he does what he did last year with more opportunity and higher volume, then he's going to be an absolute breakout star. You know, don't be surprised if he's in the running for six man of the year, depending on what the Wolves rotations look like. That's the type of player that Jalen Noel is. Um, so keep that in mind. And if anybody nationally or anybody that's not a Timberwolves fan tries to talk to you about depth, remind them about Jalen Noel in the season he had last year. All right, that's all we have for you today. Thanks again for listening to the Lockdown Wolves show. Of course, you can find the show anywhere you listen to podcasts. A big thank you to those of you that do make Lockdown Wolves your first listen each and every day. You can also follow on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves and at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. The Lockdown Wolves podcast is, of course, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. And uh, you can, again, find us anywhere you listen. For your second listen, you can get up to date on the latest news and rumors in the NBA in just 30 minutes on uh, every single day, Monday through Friday, with the show Locked On NBA. Locked On NBA is your daily NBA update in just 30 minutes. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Locked On Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.